Gary Christoffi. I'm an architect. And uh, around 2004, I was introduced to ceramics by my ex-boss, Ted Osborne. Um, he used to make ceramics here and bring them over to the office and uh, auction them so we can buy some books for the office, for the library. So I used to buy a lot of his ceramics and one day he says, hey, just why don't you just come over to the studio and make them yourself? So I did. And I got hooked ever since and so I've been here for 15 years. What's great about ceramics that's different than architecture is that you can get stuff done in a, in a short period of time. Uh, whereas in architecture you have projects that last anywhere from six months to four or five years. In ceramics you can make something and it can be fired and you can have it in your hands in a couple of weeks. So that brings a lot of satisfaction, uh, quick satisfaction. Uh, you can see quick results and then um, augment your results to obtain whatever else you want to get um, out of a particular type of ceramic. So um, as far as uh, ceramics um, and how it relates to architecture, uh, recently when I've done a lot of sculptural pieces, um, I find that uh, because uh, it's more tactile, you can mold play with your hands, you get a better sense of how uh, all the different shapes that you can create and that can be adapted into architectural forms. Um, so it's, 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 the, it's the fact that you can, that's, that's tangible, you can touch it with your hands and mold it that makes it so much more of a learning tool when it comes to architecture. The fundraiser that I'm working on is, uh, is for the school, and um, it's it. The title is threshold, so the threshold for me could be a lot of things. In the case of my piece, it's the um, I have a box and uh, two hands with um, with the hands creating plate uh, planes, wall planes, and roof planes that ultimately result in buildings. So the threshold for me is, is the office and what it creates with the hands and what it offers to the community. Basically, everything has been done in the past. When you look at museums from cultures from 5,000 years ago, you see that they've done pretty much everything you see here. Um, I'm trying some new techniques in slip casting. I'm introducing color. And slip casting is where you create a mold and you pour a liquid inside and then it forms a thickness and then you pop it out. I'm trying to create a lot of um, new designs, uh, new color variations, integration of um, different types of patterns, etc. Uh, everything else that I do has been done in the past, so I, I can't claim anything as mine. But you know, there's variations within each style, and everyone has their own their own look. Um, you can tell from pe people's pieces on these shelves who, who did what if, if you know them and you know their style. Uh, so there's nothing new, but then again, there's people creating their own unique twists on what's been done in the past.
Okay, I think the most challenging and the most exciting parts are both the same for me. And that is you never know what's going to come out of the kiln when it's fired. So the challenge is trying to get consistency with your pieces and to make them a certain way so they're fired, they don't crack. And then when you glaze them, uh, make sure that you get a consistency. But again, the, that's the bad part and that's also the fun part in that when you do get your pieces out of the kiln, it's always a surprise. It's like opening presents at Christmas time. You never know what you're going to get. So I think there's a lot of people that come into the studio looking for the pieces and they're always surprised to see what came out. Because it's not exactly what you expected. Uh, sometimes it's really different, it's really good, and sometimes it's not so good. But you, know, you have to take the good with the bad. I think the biggest challenge was the box because I was told that if I fire it in Raku that it would uh, it might crack because of um, the heat. There's, it's so, there's so much surface on the box that it, when it would heat up it might crack. So I left it as is. I only fired it once and I'm going to probably put some um, acrylic paint on it with some variations in colors to, to match the other pieces. So it's going to be a mixed media piece. Well, the, another challenge with, with the piece was that um, just the, the color, the glaze. Um, I, I thought they were going to come out, come out a certain way and most of them did and some were surprises. Um, so I have to, ultimately, because it's a big puzzle, I have to put the puzzle together and figure out what goes well together and what doesn't, and how I can either delete pieces or add other pieces, or um, do whatever else it takes to bring the puzzle together into one coherent piece. When you walk into a gallery or when you walk into a show and you see a piece, whether it's a painting or sculpture or whatever it is, um, you should come up with your own ideas of what it is and not be swayed or, or you know, your, your, your initial reaction should not be changed by the title of the piece. It brings you closer to other artists and then you get to talk about your ideas and concepts and um, if there's a camaraderie with artists and uh, it just um, allows you to express yourself and to learn from others. All right, so this is where it all happens. Uh, this is my spot in the studio. I'm here every Saturday. And uh, once I started the uh, fundraiser ceramic piece, um, I started making uh, the box here with flat pieces and the sculptural uh, piece of the hands and the other buildings and um, wall planes. Uh, once, you, once the pieces were made here, then we put them on cookies uh, plaster bats, I should say, and we put them on the shelves under plastic. This is one of my pieces right here. So you, they're covered until they, they um, uh, basically lose some of their water. And from here, once they become what's called leather hard, we put them here on these shelves. Um, to uh, and they and they dry some more right here until when you touch them, they don't feel cold. That means they're dry enough. And then we take them over to the shelves over here, the constructors. Bring them over to the shelves right here. And then from here, once they're ready and it's their turn, they go into one of the kilns over here for bisque firing. So bisque firing is the first firing that we do for the pieces so that they can absorb the glaze. So these two, these two, uh, three kilns here, that's an electric kiln, that's an electric kiln, this is a gas fire kiln. So this is what we fire, the, the bisque firing. And you can see the bisque firing here. This is an example of that. You can hear how, how it is. So basically it's, 70, it's, fired, it's fired to 1700 degrees and then this way it can absorb glaze for the final firing. For the Raku firing, um, 
the process is the same up until this point. Um, we also do a high, what's called high fire here with these two gas kilns and this goes to 2400 degrees. Here's an example of some of the high fire pieces here. You can see them all here. Uh, but for Raku firing, um, I use special glazes for Raku and that gets fired to 1800 degrees. So the best firing is at approximately 1800 and then the Raku firing is again at 1800. Whereas for the high fire, it's 1800 for the best firing and the 2400 degrees for the final fire. So uh, I'll show you some of the special Raku glazes I would use. Back here we have some of the Raku glazes and these are the examples of the different colors. You can see whether it's turquoise or red bronze or orange or amethyst. Um, so there's, uh, you, you apply a couple of coats of the glaze and it has to be within 24 hours of the firing. And we put them on the shelves and then uh, we fire them outside. I don't want to give away my concept and I don't want to give away anything other than what I said because I, I think the viewer should make up their own story and that's the, I think that's the beauty of any sculpture.